Hey, how are we doing? It is a special live show, so hopefully everybody can hear us okay. Hopefully you can see us. I know we're a little behind here. Hey, how are we doing? It is a special... Let's kill some extra sound here. Sorry about that. <laughs> I've got like three laptops opened up here and a desktop, and my server is winding over here on the left as well, too. So hopefully everybody can see me. I, again, have multiple screens opened up, which I usually don't. Um, we've got some technical issues here. Sorry, we are late. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear us. So if you see me moving back and forth, it's just me moving between a different PC. Um, we have been on for a little while. There's been some technical glitches. Um, we've got some horrendously bad weather where we're at. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it. We've had a bunch of tornadoes touch down yesterday and the day before uh, that affected people we know and actually places we go. So um, there's been a lot of bad weather around here too. I'm gonna bring Chris out in just a few minutes here. I think most people know Chris. If you haven't met Chris, heard Chris, seen Chris or anything like that, I actually have a direct link in the description right below that will take you straight to his page. He is actually in chat as well too. So if you click on his name, it's going to give you three dots and you can go straight to his page and actually subscribe right now. So no sense in waiting. Again, I hope everybody can hear us properly. If somebody can just shout out, um, I don't see anybody telling me they can hear me yet, but if somebody has that, I would be very happy. Yeah, it looks like everybody can hear me fine. So we do have some folks floating in here. Uh, just a second here. I'm sorry. I apologize for this. I know we're a little bit late here again, as I said. Not terribly. Um, I'm just glad to be on. So um, without further ado, we're going to pop Chris on up here and let Chris introduce himself and talk a little bit about himself. If you can just say how you got into this to start with, Chris, um, let people know who you are and we will go from there. Hey everyone, I'm Chris, the Thrift Shop Hustler. I've been on eBay since uh, the early days, 1995, 1996, so I got plenty of experience there. I also have a YouTube channel where I do what's sold on eBay videos, some vlogs, and uh, I share some of my knowledge with uh, the different things that I've been collecting uh, over the years. And uh, glad to be here, Don, man. It's been a, it's been a crazy day, man. It's been an insane day, and uh, I really appreciate you having me on your channel for sure. This means a lot to me. Well, I'm honestly glad to have you on. We've both had some major issues today. Um, I actually talked to Chris earlier today um, for a little while. Then he had some things come up and we had to cut it short. And then we're back on here. So I'm really glad to have Chris on. There's not many people you know that I have on my channel. So um, Chris is honestly a good guy. There's going to be a couple other folks on the channel here in the very near future. Again, there are people like me. Uh, people who look at the internet differently than than most people. Anybody who knows knows I am um, not a big marketer. I'm not a big person into promotions on on lots of stuff. Um, and Chris is just like me. Um, he does a lot of stuff like I do. He's got art background. And if you don't know, Chris is actually Evilos on YouTube as well. And that's kind of where I actually found out about Chris to begin with. I um, mean, we've talked in the background here and we text each other and we've talked on the phone and all this kind of stuff too in the past. And again, for those who know my channel, you know I don't put anybody on here. So I honestly recommend you to actually subscribe to Chris if you have not. I don't say that very often. Chris is a real good guy. Um, you know, and again, I have talked to him many, many times now. We've gotten to know each other, you know, and uh, Chris is just a good guy. So Chris actually works for does eBay as well, obviously, but he actually works for the American Cancer Society. And I thought this would be a good way to actually show you um, another side of the whole atmosphere of what we do. He gets donations in. Um, literally, he's like the main guy who does all their online parts for the American Cancer Society. Let's let him talk about that just a little bit and how exciting and different it is to go from a point where you're sourcing for things versus people bringing it to you, if that kind of gives you a uh, in there, Chris, on that one. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, yeah, it's actually kind of crazy to think in a way I've came full circle uh, my title here is uh, eBay Hub Manager. I've had this job for about six months. And uh, I've worked in post-production for 15 years. I was laid off last summer after having that job for a long time and kind of didn't know what I was going to do. You know, I have a, a large background in, in uh, art and eBay and stuff, so I thought I'd fall back on that a little bit. 
uh, that was really, really hard for me to kind of do. And uh, just from having relationships of going to uh, different thrift shops over the years, I found out there, there was a job opening here uh, that they were looking for a replacement uh, for a lady who uh, moved on to another career. And so uh, I did an interview and uh, they, they liked me and I, and I liked the situation. I was hired here full time uh, um, doing uh, their eBay, basically running their eBay business. We have about 16 shops uh, underneath us there's 48 shops total on the west coast and so uh, if anyone's in california or washington you're looking for another place other than goodwill uh they're called discovery shops from the american cancer society uh they're very reasonably priced we have a bunch of them here in california uh, i work out of the burbank office so um, i'm here monday through friday if you're ever in burbank you want to stop by and say hello and uh basically you know i go through some of the stuff i do the listing i i, I manage a couple employees um, and basically run the business to grow the their online presence uh, on eBay. And that's basically the short of it. On on my biggest question on that is, is it is it like hard to get used to people actually dropping stuff off for you? I've seen quite a few of the things that you actually get. And for what most people see, it seems like you get a lot of good items there. Are the the items that you actually get better than what you've run into in the past when you're actually sourcing? So here's the thing. There's kind of like a lot of levels to that. Um, I don't deal directly with the, do the donations, uh, though, you know, I could go into the back of any shop and kind of dig through whatever has been donated. Uh, a lot of the stuff is, is brought to me. And, um, you know, that takes uh, a little bit of uh, kind of education on the manager's part because a lot of them are so used to close and a lot of that kind of stuff, they, they don't have any idea about, well, they, some of them do, but you know, uh, I, I bring a wealth of experience about, you know, video games, collectibles, uh, a lot of that stuff that might get passed up. So uh, they bring me stuff. I go in the back, you know, it's, it's, it's very, it's a very fluid kind of thing that happens. And your, your question about like, do you, you know, do I find, you know, how does the good stuff up appear? Like, it, you know, it does, it just sometimes stuff's donated and, and you're lucky and you find it. And uh, a lot of the stuff still goes out in the shop. So if people are looking for goodies and stuff to resell, it's not because I work here that you're never going to find anything good. There's always stuff that I can go, I can go walk out right now and show you guys uh, some value that is still out there. But that's pretty much the gist of uh, what happens is for the most part, a lot of the managers will put stuff to the side for eBay and a majority goes out to uh, the floor. That's kind of interesting. Um, just along that too, um, you said post-production. Are you literally talking about editing videos and things along that line? Is that literally what you mean by post-production? Yeah. So I started out uh, labeling like tapes and VHSs and DVDs and worked my way up through management and then uh, had a job over the last five years where I was actually editing content. Um, I basically, my job was uh, an encoder um, and basically what I did is I created files for Netflix, iTunes, uh, Sony, Amazon, Hulu. So basically anytime you see a streaming movie that's on Netflix or on anywhere, um, usually our department had something to do with that, whether it be, you know, I'd edit off the bumpers and then export it to a specific thing the client wanted. And so uh, I worked on a lot of great TV shows. I worked on Breaking Bad. I worked on Days of Our Lives of all things for like eight years. That was like, I was known as the Days of Our Lives guy. You know, we had to, I had to do some creative editing on that. So it was very cool. But uh, yeah, that, that's a very interesting business. And, I, and it, what's great is working in that environment has taught me a lot about video editing. You know, I haven't really done any crazy editing with my YouTube videos, but you know, I have the technical knowledge of uh, being able to do creative editing and exporting to specific specs that are needed for any kind of environment like uh, Instagram or, or, or Twitter or, or make little clips. Um, th that experience has has helped uh, tremendously in my YouTube uh, career. So I guess that leads me to why why did you get started on YouTube, I guess? I know you were Evilos before. So what brought you around to actually the reseller aspect of YouTube? Because I, I know you've been around. I've seen many of your Evilos videos as well. Um, obviously, Gary V, as you know, is the one that I actually saw. You were talking about the Gary V figure. And actually, it's in a couple oh, yeah. of your videos. So that's literally what caught my eye. So why YouTube and why what brought you into the thrift market in general? Right. So uh, I've I've had probably like five or six YouTube channels uh, over the course of the years. 
Um, ever since uh, actually YouTube started, I wish I would have I would have kept going with some of those channels that I had because who knows where I'd be at now. I kind of gave up on a lot of those. I was doing like doing I was building the lightsabers. You never heard about this, but well, I used to actually build lightsabers. We used to get parts like hilts and and custom laid, and and then we'd put all the electronics together. And that was like one of my first YouTube channels was uh, putting lightsabers together. And then I got into were cards. Those, were those metal lightsabers, or were they the standard, the plastic ones? Like no, this? no, they were metal. So like oh, someone really? would make custom lay them out, drill the holes, and then we'd get like uh, people would make uh, specialty tubes that you can actually run LEDs from the base from the hilt. And it would shine through there and there'd be like electronic. There's a whole business now. If you look, uh, if you go to customsabers.com, there's a whole industry that spawned from that stuff that I was a part of a long time ago. But anyways, transitioning into the thrift store stuff is, you know, I've been reselling since I was uh, six years old, eight years old. I was at the flea markets. You know, I worked at a baseball card shop when I was 10. Uh, you know, I worked at a comic book shop in my teenage years and I worked at a hobby shop in 2001. So I have a lot of experience about all these different collectibles. And I thought, you know, why don't I saw some someone else doing videos about uh, basically going and finding stuff at thrift stores. And I thought that's a great kind of uh, channel idea to do. So that's where the thrift shop hustler came in, because, you know, I thought like, yeah, I got to make a catchy name because that's another thing too. If you want to start a YouTube channel, you got to have something that's kind of gimmicky and, and catchy. And so that's where the thrift shop hustler came in because I'd go to like four or five different thrift shops a day, just trying to hustle and, and find stuff. And and here I am on the thrift shop hustler. We have almost have 8,000 subscribers. So uh, you just passed 8,000. Congratulations, Don. You're going to, uh, you, you have amazing content, man, on your channel. And by the way, uh, if you're not subscribed to Don, definitely go down and <laughs> click the subscribe button. <laughs> <laughs> click the bell for notification. I think I'm up to like 82, 20 or something like that, somewhere in that. Yeah. Chris is approaching eight. Hopefully we can get him up to eight today. That would be really nice. So if you haven't subscribed, hit that subscribe button again. I have a link right down below for him. Uh, let's pop back over this way here for a second. Um, Hang on just a second here. My notes are kind of scattered, which isn't usually oh, for no me. Problem. No problem. No <laughs> problem. I got it's like, been one of those days, man. <laughs> yeah, it has. My whole weekend was was taken uh, aback here. Um, I didn't have any videos up really this weekend here. Um, just FYI for those of you who watched the channel, um, I was doing a, uh, a canopy I added to our deck out there out of some pipes. Something I made, and it was a lot of stitching, and my whole weekend's been that. I've got a nail hole in my head, and I got a nice little nail hole here from hitting the ceiling. Oh, um, no. had to tear apart the uh, the soffit and add wood to put support. Uh, it was just a hassle. So, And then this morning we've had the issues and then the weather and everything else. So it, it's been one of those days. Um, let's shoot off on um, a couple of your videos here. Now, I've been into uh, VHS, obviously. I grew up on VHS. Me and Chris both go back to a, a very long time ago. Um, I started selling and doing art and stuff like that when I was seven. So Chris is right up there along it with me. Um, I've said this before and I'll say it again. It's in people's blood. I, I should have done this 20 plus years ago. And like Chris saying, um, who knows where he would have been if he would have had his video channel still going. The same thing. If, if I would have done a lot of what I'm doing now, 20 years ago, you know, I'd probably be a millionaire and I, not to exaggerate or, or throw some strange number out there, but Back in the day when you first started on eBay, and Chris knows this as well as I do, you could sell anything. I mean, you could sell a ketchup, a ketchup popsicle to a Eskimo and all white. I mean, that's that's one of the, the statements I've heard somebody say. Back in the day, I mean, we sold crazy things for crazy prices. What's your craziest out there thing that you've ever sold? And I'll, I'll tell you mine in just a minute here, but we'll let Chris shoot his out here first. The craziest thing I've ever sold or the most or something that went for the most money because the thing is I've sold just Normal things. I, I don't think I can ever recall like selling something crazy like it was just insane, but uh, I've, I have talked about finding uh, like statues these couple statues before at a thrift shop that I bought for 50 bucks ended up selling for 5,000 that was probably like the craziest like money I've ever made as far as ROI but as far as like the craziest item, I haven't like I never sold like a, a Dorito shaped as Mother <laughs> Mary or anything like that. So I really don't have a good story on that. I've just like literally been one of those sellers who just sold like all kinds of things throughout the years. Well, I'll give you a crazy one. I'm not one to believe in, in you know, uh, many oddball spiritual things. 
But um, we had a ugly, 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 like figurine of some sort. And uh, I had to title it Haunted because this thing was just creepy, creepy beyond all belief. Um, it, it literally was like the weirdest thing. I don't even know where it was, what it was made, where it came from or nothing. And it was sold as a haunted item. And sure enough, the person who got it swears it was haunted and had to get rid of it after he had it for a week in the whole works. It was a big, long story. The guy emailed me back twice. Highest item I ever sold was a, a Prevo, which is a RV. Um, it's like a touring bus that you would see like a rock group in. And um, I sold that for 150000 oh, wow. uh, I took a commission on it, obviously, of 5%. So let's just say I did extremely well for it was, and that was after the fees. But that was my craziest thing. Let's ask Chris again here on something else. Um, you've done one of the videos that I was surprised on, and I've done one on, on VHS tapes as well, Disney specifically. I know we all know that the Black Diamond are just pretty much a, a money laundering scheme as far as I'm concerned. We know Song of the South, but you mentioned another one in one of your videos. And unfortunately, I wrote it down. And if you could see my notes, I've got literally three pages of notes just on Chris. <laughs> and I watched a bunch of the videos to get some, some conversation in. I can't, what was the name of that one Disney video that you had? I can't remember. I, I'm wondering if it's one of the very first ones. Was it, it must have been like Robin Hood or something like that? Because uh, in the very early days, they came in black clamshells instead of white clamshells. Yeah, I think maybe that's what it was, the black. Yeah, one. and so the very first ones go for a lot of money. And and some of the prices of, uh, I don't know if you worked at Disney World. You know, remember in the 80s when they'd come out with those uh VHS is about like, oh, all about Epcot or all about Disneyland, and they'd take you through all the different places. Some of those are actually starting to go up in value too. But for the most part, you know, when you see black diamonds, uh, they're usually not worth that much. If you can get a whole set together that's not messed up because the plastic ages over the years, and that's what's so hor horrible about the old DVD or the old uh, VHSs for Disney, is that plastic breaks very easily. So finding a mint condition sealed even stuff is really hard to find. And some of those can actually go for, you know, 10 to 20 bucks a piece. The one that I know the most uh, that I sell routinely is the um, X-rated Little Mermaid version. Um, oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> eight yeah. To 20 bucks. You know, I worked there when that was made and, and I would be willing to bet you I know who did the hard work, but, you know, that's <laughs> neither here nor there. Um, let's talk a little bit about, I know you, you're doing toys, you do some custom creations, um, and you've done a lot of the Funko and the custom Funkos. I mean, are you thinking about getting back into that? I know because we do toys now and we're doing some other things going on too. Is that a revenue stream currently for you or is that something that you're going to be popping back into as well? Again, he does Evilos, so type in Evilos here on YouTube and you're going to see Chris again, so... Yeah, so I've kind of be I've kind of been semi-retired for about a year and a half. I used to be heavily into customs. I did amiibos. Have you ever heard of amiibos? They're like uh, Nintendo makes them. No, like that little, one I don't know. Yeah, they're little figures, and I got into that. I was doing Vinylmations. You're very well of, of uh, probably aware of Vinylmations since you worked at Disney. Little uh, figures. Um, you know, I had a pretty good run doing art, you know, uh, I guess in the reseller world, we'd call it private label. That's, that's yeah, how I yeah, kind of, yeah. that's how I kind of look at it. Like, you know, we're making stuff and we're selling it, but I, I, you know what, I had a good run, you know, like, uh, I, I would go to conventions. I had booths, you know, I was known as Evilos and I, and I was fairly popular in that world. And, uh, there was just a lot of things that discouraged me and kind of like moving on and wanting to build the thrift shop hustler kind of channel and this whole persona, uh, kind of took a, a turn. Like, uh, I don't know if I've ever told you this story, but uh, when I was doing Amiibos, um, Toys R Us actually reached out to me to do a custom for their online store. And so we got all the way to the last week of it almost being released and Nintendo pulled the plug at the very last minute due to IP something or another. I guess Toys R Us was kind of doing some backward deal but uh we had the figures in the warehouse they were ready to go up on to the shop that weekend and i got a phone call on friday saying you know i'm sorry chris but uh, nintendo pulled the plug on this deal and that would have been probably one of the major things in my art career that would have really taken off because to my knowledge toys R Us has never done that with uh, any kind of artist to be to be honest as far as selling a custom-made toy on online and it being a limited edition. So that was very devastating for me. I've had like gaslighting with, with Disney artists, you know, and 
you know, they tell me one thing and then I'll, I'll make all this concept art for an event that they're having. Like, uh, there was a Honda mansion event that they did one year, uh, the D 23 convention I did. And then all of a sudden in the very last minute, they're like, uh, sorry, we don't like the way this character looks. So sorry, that's you're Disney. out. Yeah. That, that, so I was gonna say that's definitely Disney. Um, I did concept drawings for a remote control boat ride inside the 20,000 leagues lagoon in Disney world. I went, I mean, they spent a lot of money for me to do concepts. They pulled in uh, a mic, which was another guy that did some artwork and did stickers and handouts for the, the magic kingdom. And we had spent, you know, on and off like a month on this thing or more, just of, of solid time on this, had concepts, full color renderings. We had, you know, estimates, um, WED was in there, um, you know, Imagineering, the whole works. And at the last second, after all of this, they decided they were going to keep the lagoon empty. You know, it was a lot of time. I just can't believe they do that. Disney is notorious for doing stuff like that. You know, I was doing some uh, mural work at Disney and it's still there. And um, during, while I'm doing it, one of the uh, other people came in from one of the actual full-fledged art departments, the head guy, and it wasn't going through the proper union. So they they did some big stink and tried to get it canceled. And then my boss got in some, some trouble. It was a, a huge ordeal. I mean, it was a, a two-week, um, they stopped it for two weeks while they argued who had the authority to run it through which union. It was just a, a stink. I'm not a big fan on stuff like that with Disney there their uh, particular, I, I had a painting on the back of my car. I painted Knights on Bald Mountain, the, the devil on top of the mountain on a, on a T-bird that I had. And I parked it in the parking lot, you know, for like two weeks. And they told me if I ever wanted to come back again, that was going to be off my car because I worked there, which was just so petty. I mean, it's my property, but we're on private property. They didn't want somebody to see this and you know, it matched the rims on the car and the whole works. It was just a, a, a bad thing. They're, they're after every dime they can get. Yeah, Disney's a Disney's one of those companies, man, that they've changed a lot over the years. And I mean, for good and bad, you know, that's kind of like, you know, back in Walt's day, you couldn't have a mustache, you couldn't have facial, you know, uh, well, stuff. You, you, you could if you worked in the art department, you couldn't if you worked in the park. That's yeah. the difference. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, a lot to change. My wife has actually worked for Disney twice. Uh, she does temp work and stuff with them. We're, we're in Burbank, California. For those that don't know, Disney Studios is here. A uh, wed and Imagineering that you were just talking about is the, in the city over literally five minutes from where I'm at right now. And so uh, she's worked on Plush. She works on uh, Soft Lines. And uh, she'll probably be going back at some point too. So uh, we have a pretty interesting relationship with Disney. You know, a lot of, I know a lot of those Vinylmation artists uh, that were in Florida. Some of them actually moved here and are actually working out of the uh, flower uh, campus over here now. So uh, I love Disney and Disney sells. Uh, I mean, you know, you have to have your right things, you know, like some of the hidden gems are like the pennies. I'm I'm, I'm thinking like the press pennies now have started to kind of take off too. Have you ever looked into that market? No, I haven't touched, haven't touched that one at all. Um, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say like, uh, yeah, look into press pennies. If you've never looked into that, it's. Oh, you're talking about the elongated ones. Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah. And, yeah. I did a whole video on that actually. Oh, you did? There you yeah, go. I hear, I've never heard them called press pennies. Um, literally, if you look on eBay, they're going to say elongated pennies in the section, but I got a whole video on that because I actually have people that send me those from Disney right now. I mean, I've got, should I talk to people at Disney probably 10 times a week, maybe right now, because where we worked, we had, geez, I don't know how many friends we, let me pop these back around. We had a, a ton of friends. We still associate with them. They send me prints and posters. Um, you know, Disney was good for some things. They actually paid for my college for art classes um, to get in. And I did some work with Fran Kirsten, which used to be head of ink and paint. And then there's um, another gentleman named Saul Blinkoff, who um, I worked with, who actually does animation now. And um, I went through the whole process as well with these guys too. So, I mean, I, I did stuff with animation personally, um, all my art that was um, uh, condoned through the magic kingdom and any of the park systems that I did stickers and the other things I did were all condoned. And um, they actually ended up giving me color codes and uh, character codes for every character I did. They gave me actually the cell vinyl paint to paint the murals, which is literally a vinyl paint that's made that'll stick to plastic because the cells back in that, the days, were all um, 
sear, uh, clear acetate and you needed vinyl to do it. Um, I, I grew up on the old school animation. I've actually painted cells myself and spent my allowances for, for quite some time making animation cells and doing little animation. So I have a, a affiliation with animation in general, but Disney on one hand, you're, you're just a number. I Don't get me wrong. It depends on where you work in there. If you were in animation in your little cubicle, I mean, they take care of you in, in art directors and things like that and in, in art departments and purchasing. But if you're working in for the park system itself, you're pretty much just a, a nobody, I guess, from my personal experience. Well, I got a couple of great, uh, before we move on, I got a couple of, well, so I remember I have a couple of great stories for you. Uh, one, um, there's an artist that lives here in Burbank. He's very well known. I won't mention his name, but um, he's a Disney artist. And uh, I went up to his uh, his house one time for, I, I was donating stuff for a charity he was doing. And I went up to his office and he had the, the, the Nautilus model from the movie, the cutaway oh, wow. with all the little lights and stuff in it. Now it was, it was on a huge desk with like papers and stuff all over it. And I was just so, I was just like, could I just take this and clean this up for you at least? Cause it, it had stuff all over it. And it was just like a piece of Disney history, just sitting on this dude's desk with like all kinds of stuff on it. That's, that's the, that's the one story. Uh, the other story is I was into animation too. When uh, I was in high school, we had extra curricular activities uh, to earn extra points for for whatever to graduate. And uh, I took animation for two years. And me and the, me and my friend were like the top of our class, so we won a uh, inter internship at Nickelodeon because Nickelodeon Studios is here. I'm not sure if you knew that. Uh, it, at, I think it opened here in like 1998, just when we were graduating. So. Um, I was young. I was dumb. I loved like skateboarding, partying with my friends, hanging out with girls and, and doing that kind of stuff. So to me, I didn't want to go work for free, you know, at in summer at Nickel Nickelodeon, though people would probably kill for that right now. So uh, anyways, to make a long story short, uh, they took us on a tour to me and this, me and my friend, his name was Jeep. Uh, we went there, you know, they showed us around, they introduced us to all kinds of people and they're like, well, this is the person you're going to work with. It was the head of animation for something. And they're showing us the concept designs. And I'm like looking at this stuff and I'm 18. I think I'm like hot stuff. And I'm just like, you know, in my head, I'm thinking no one's ever going to watch this crap. Like, what is this? Uh, who's ever going to watch a, a sponge in the bottom of a sea with like a, a, a starfish as a friend? And I'm like, this is stupid. <laughs> That show was Sponge, SpongeBob SquarePants, and I would have been uh, the lead animator's assistant that summer for that show when it first aired that first season. And to this day, I regret, like, because I didn't go back. I was just like, I'm going to go have fun. I'm going to, it's summertime. I don't want to do this. And uh, to this day, that's one of, like, my biggest regrets in my life. <laughs> that's, that's a shame. not doing that thing. That is a crying out shame. I've had some some really good experiences. I'm not going to go into a punch on Disney because I could run, you know, a 10 hour show just talking about events that happen at Disney. Yeah. For those who don't know, I worked at Disney for 10 plus years. I have a pension. The wife has a pension. Um, in fact, uh, it's too far away. I was going to show you my pension notice just came in, which was kind of odd. Um, Again, I, I, 10 years at Disney, uh, it, it was a good experience. That was probably the um, best time of my life for hanging out with friends and things like that. I met my wife at Disney. We got married at Disney unofficially. We broke one of the major rules to actually um, get married at a place called Little Lake Bryan. It's not there anymore. It's actually uh, Animal Kingdom now. I was an old school person at Disney. Um, first time I went to Disney, it cost seventeen fifty to get in. My wife just told oh me God. it's $110, I think, for a one-day, one-season, or a one-day, one-park pass, if I'm not mistaken, plus yeah. parking. Um, it's something like that. I, I'm sure she said it was like 110 She's not handy here, but... It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Th they've won up a lot. Let's veer off the Disney, Disney <laughs> track here for a minute. Let's here. go. <laughs> get away. Let's swim out of that, yeah, that let's, uh, swamp. <laughs> We got some questions coming in, but let's just ask just a few more of Chris before we answer some questions here. Let me pop away up because it looks like I got a whole bunch of people in the house. Um, if you haven't hit the like button, I got 120 people almost watching and only 27 oh, wow. likes. So yeah, if click we the can, like button. yes, most definitely hit that like button. And again, if you haven't checked out Chris, I do have a direct link 
directly below in the actual cut or the um, the uh, description section. And you can also click on Chris's actual uh, name, the three dots next to him, and you'll be able to go straight to his site. So we're trying to get Chris up to the 8,000 mark. I know he's a little bit off, but if we can do that for Chris, that would be an awesome thing to, to do today. Um, let's talk about a little bit about the changes on eBay because this one here, I get more questions on than anything else. And no matter what I tell them, uh, people still think it's less, it's time to give up on eBay. Um, I sell, <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. I oh, sell God. on many platforms, so I don't rely on any site anymore. eBay is a good breadwinner, but for me, any of the changes they do are already water under the bridge for me. I'm not worried. In fact, some of the changes with like sending offers out has increased my sales. I mean, our sales, I'm not going to be bragging on my sales, but our sales are are through the roof, um, way up from the last year. Right now, I've, this is my busiest month. If this was last year, this would be my busiest month for the entire year so far. What What's your take on all the changes? Is it time to quit eBay, Chris, or not? <laughs> no, it's never time. Here's the thing. like I'm a kind of guy who rolls with the punches. If you're not ready or willing to adapt to any changes, you might not business reselling might not be for you because there's literally things changing every day. You usually got to, you know, redo your whole business plan, usually yearly, monthly, weekly, even. And no, eBay's one of the greatest uh, sites ever. I mean, there's, there's lots of traffic. Uh, sure. There's a, there's other sites. I mean, Amazon's not bad for certain things. Here's the thing you need to learn how to niche down for specific things. Like I sell a lot of books on Amazon. I'll sell video games on Macari. I'll sell, you know, the harder to find items on eBay. So you need to just figure out, you know, what you want to do with your items. But eBay is very far from being like done. Sure. There's a lot of complaints about returns right now. That's one of the major things I hear uh, in my channels is uh, just the, the frivolous uh, returns and how everyone's upset because they're, they're very seller or very buyer centric right now in their history. Uh, you know, you know, they do a lot more things for this, for the, for the buyer than the seller. But uh, for me, it's just one of those things. If they change, I change my business model. I don't, I don't, I don't, it doesn't, I don't lose sleep over that stuff. So, so there you have it from somebody else. I'm telling you right now, I don't care what eBay does. I take it as a challenge, whatever it is, we just move on. I change, I adapt and I go on. It's it's a huge chunk of my revenue. But again, if, if eBay shut down tomorrow, I still wouldn't be hurting. We'd make less money, of course, but you know, it, it would still be a full-time business without any issues. I'd just ramp up wherever else we're doing. So Chris, again, he's 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 telling you the same thing. You know, you can dog on the changes, but there isn't a company out here on the planet in the real world that doesn't change a couple times every year. If you work in a restaurant, let's let's shoot out a restaurant analogy here. My menu in a restaurant changed five times a year, maybe six times a year, every single year. So that meant every two, three months, you're sitting here and running a whole new menu out constantly. And then you got to know the menu. You got to know, you got to stock up, you got to order the product. You got to know what the product looks like. In a restaurant, you could have, you know, a thousand different items in inventory and, you know, everything could change on the spur of a moment. So, you know, you get set to one analogy or one way to do something and the next week it could be different. Just like, let's say uh, your insurance. Everybody talks about you want to keep the same insurance or whatever the case may be. If you work for somebody, it changes constantly. And, and I'll shoot back to Disney just for a second here. <laughs> At the time I worked at Disney for 10 years. God, I don't know how many times our insurance changed. We probably had more insurance policies than I actually had years that I worked at Disney and all honesty. Because one year they did two different ones. It was one was active for six months and then something happened and state changed, state law changed or something, and then boom, it was right back to something else. So no matter what you're doing or where you're at or what type of business you're at, you know, change is gonna happen no matter what. You know, look at Toys R Us. What happens if you don't change? So yeah. You know, Chris is, is, feels the same way, I would say, and pretty much anybody that I'm going to have on my channel is going to look at it the same basic way. And again, I don't care if somebody has a different opinion. I'm always happy to hear a different opinion, but the opinion on eBay and if it's done or not done, it's not done. I don't care what anybody says. It's in the two slot. You got Amazon number one. They're vying and fighting right now. Amazon's, you know, doing things to go after eBay with collectibles and some of the other items. Amazon's the biggest enemy. I shouldn't say enemy, but the, the biggest challenge to anybody else. 
homemade by Amazon is, is fast approaching to a, a more of a, a level up to be challenging to Etsy. I sell an Etsy. So, you know, um, it was interesting. We were on Amazon, homemade by Amazon as well, too. So, you know, you got to play the field. You got to roll with the punches. If something changes, who cares if it changed? You're still doing your your business is the same. You're still selling stuff. Who cares what it takes or what you got to jump over to actually get there to to get the sales to keep on going? Where do you see yourself, Chris? Let's pack back to another question here. Where do you see yourself? What are your what's your goals to go with eBay reselling in, in the whole works? Like in five years from now, what's your your vision or your drive? What's getting you? Um, down the road, what are you looking for? I guess out of this. Um, right now, I think my main goal is growing the American Cancer Society's eBay page. Uh, I would like us to be a million dollar a year seller. Uh, that's like my main. That's like probably my five to ten year goal. Uh, my short term goal is to uh, be able to get you know some other shops up and running uh, for themselves. We do have a few employees that are listing right now. I'd like to you know increase that. Uh, for me personally, I've kind of in my home in my personal eBay stuff, I've kind of taken a back seat with that stuff. I still do sell some items on my personal stuff, but now uh, I'm more focused. I, I like I've never had this passion in a long time to really want to, to make something a success. And I think out of all the years that I've been on eBay, uh, I've pretty much found my, my dream job and my true calling out of all the jobs I've ever had in my whole life. This is where I'm supposed to be uh, right now in my life. And I really want to see this place succeed because uh, not only is the American Cancer Society, you know, giving a, giving me a, 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 a great wage, you know, we're helping uh, potentially cure cancer. And who could say that they, they can go to a job that they actually love. And I'm literally passionate about this stuff. And I actually love getting up in the morning and saying, you know what, I'm going to go and, and play today. Like literally this job is playing, you know, might think, you know, sure, we're making money and we're doing eBay and it's hard work. But to me, this is fun all day long. Yeah, I will have to agree. Now, as, as Chris has just said, I, I've come to the epiphany that where I'm supposed to be is right here in my life. And, and had I, you know, looked back 20 years ago and, and done something and not been, you know, afraid to jump into doing this full time again, I, who knows where I'd be, but this is what I was meant to do my whole, I've been waiting all this time to find my, my calling and this is it doing this kind of stuff. So I completely agree with, with Chris. Um, I lost a, a, my, my grandma mother died to cancer. So, you know, I fully have an a, affiliation with, you know, helping out the cancer society too. So, you know, Chris is helping the cancer society. This is something from the cancer society as well, too. He gets knowledge. He's, he's getting a good paycheck, but he is helping a, a major, uh, player in the field that's helping, uh, to find a cure for this. So again, I'm not going to try and touch on a, a lighthearted topic or a, a bad topic here. Um, we won't go into cancer too much because I know that there's actually somebody on here who's fighting it right now. Who's yeah. on my subscriber field. Who's, who's reached out to me in the past. Um, you know, you got to love what you're doing and, and, Chris is like one of the few people that does love what he's doing. I mean, I know there's people, there's a lot of people here that, that do uh, eBay and have done it for a while and make some good money at it. Um, they may, they may still like what they're doing, but they don't love it. You know, I love what I'm doing. This is, that's, that's a plus. I get up early intentionally trying to see what's going to go on the next day. What do I got going on? You know, um, I was talking to Chris earlier today and you know, I have employees running around and I feel like I'm in, I'm in a cockpit and I'm in the control room and it's, it's all my show and you know, it's how I want it. I get to do it how I want. I don't have to listen to the boss. I know Chris is at a little different stake of it, but he's been there. He still has his own business in the whole works and Chris is a pretty well-rounded guy, as you can see. Um, similar style background, similar age starting into the whole field. I was selling, you know, Star Wars illustrations that, you know, at seven and eight when it first came out to school people for five cents, 10 cents. You know, I used to do the, the garage sales with my mom and, you know, swapping out stuff. My first record came from a garage sale that my first piece of music. So, you know, I, I've always, always been into this always. And, and like with Chris's job, I mean, I could see where it would be really neat because you get to see all this stuff in front of you. I don't, I don't want to own everything. So, you know, I love looking at stuff. I do have a collection of certain things, but 99% of everything I get is gone. It's sold, but I do enjoy, and I, I fully fledged enjoy it. I, if if you, there's a video I did not too long ago about 
the uh, uh, Chinese um, issued ID to a U.S. soldier. I honestly was shaking when I saw that item. That's how much of a historical piece that thing was, that it really was something that really blew me away. That's how much I am into this, that, you know, you got to... You gotta love it. It's not just a job for me. This is this is me. This is my whole life. This is what I do. Everything revolves around it. The wife gets it, and anybody who knows me knows that you know if we're out in the mall somewhere, I'm gonna be looking at prices on stuff to resell. I hate to say it, but you know, um, lunchbox sometimes we we end up going through there a lot or a discount. I was at Walmart today to buy a, a, a something. And sure enough, they had a table of discount electronics right now sitting in the electronics section. And I bought like 17 items for RA. So, you know, I, I wasn't supposed to be there for that. I told the wife I'd be back in, you know, 10 minutes. It's just down the street. 45 minutes later, I came home with a, you know, a cart full of stuff. I had no intention in doing that. But I, I, I can't. How, how do you feel when you go out, Chris? What What's your take when you're out in public looking at stuff? It's a sickness, man. <laughs> we, have, tell you. We, have, we have a disease, dude. And like. I can't, the, here's the thing is like, you were mentioning about how like rolling with the punches with eBay and I feel, do you feel because we've been in this game for such a long time that we have a different perspective? I mean, heck, like I used to actually take photographs with 35 millimeter film of I stuff, those I, days. stuff I was going to put on eBay, develop the film, come back, scan it on my scanner so that I can get a digital photograph because digital cameras were expensive back in those days. Way and, then, expensive. and then when I sold something, I had to go to the post office, wait in the line, fill out the thing. I didn't have a printer that really was working that well. And then if I wanted to buy something, I had to go to the post office, get a postal money order, send it out, and then pray I'd get it in like four weeks or something like that. So when I see people complain about eBay today, I'm like, maybe that's it. We've been through the kind of, uh, the world war one, um, yeah. <laughs> the, the trenches. And so we, we look at the stuff that happens now and it's like, ah, that's nothing. Yeah. Th that's the same take I, I have on it too, because back in the day, if I'm not mistaken, I know like, uh, maybe six or seven, maybe eight years ago, it used to be like two pages to list one item. Um, you go back 15 years ago, it used to be three pages to list one item. And when I first started, I, I swear, and I, I kept I'm trying to get this into my head. I don't have anything, documents or pictures of anything from back then. But it used to be like four pages. You'd have to go through one page just for shipping options, another page for the item, another page to upload photos. It used to be some long, drawn-out process. That's when they originally started with Mr. Lister. Um, I don't even know if they have any of that, any of those programs anymore. I never had much luck after they updated them. Um, but again, we started off from, from ground zero with eBay. I was on eBay the first year they were called eBay and, and Chris was pretty much the same, same time frame. So th there's been so many changes back in the day. You could bid on your own item. You were allowed to bid on your item once. Um, you know, I don't know what happens if you want it. I, I never rem remember anything beyond that, but you could bid on your own item and you could leave negative feedback for buyers. Those are two of the things that everybody, you know, ranted and raved about when they got rid of. Um, you know, five star started in foods for anybody who doesn't know that whole five star junk that they're doing. I don't agree with five star and I didn't agree with it when it rolled into the food industry, you know, 20 plus years ago or whenever it was, but it wasn't foods, you know, five or six years before it hit eBay. Um, you know, but you know, we moved on, things are still fine. Um, you know, we're still at a hundred percent feedback and, you know, I don't worry about any of that stuff. I, if eBay completely changed around the entire list page i wouldn't care anymore i, I don't yeah. i don't care if they mess with the hub as long as the information's there the 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 way it's brought to me doesn't matter anymore i mean because i can set something up my own way it's all customizable you can rearrange your hub you can get rid of links you can add stuff i mean i don't i hated the hub when i first started it i don't know your opinion but when i first started the hub i hate it but nowadays you know I look at my my bank account and, and the other stuff going on. I mean, like, who cares? You're, you're talking about petty stuff um, beyond belief. All this is petty in my book because I'm on eight other platforms. What do I, I'm not going to worry all my time on what eBay's doing, I, you know, because I got Etsy to worry about and Discogs and Amazon and, you know, the um, hub stamps and all that kind of stuff or hub, hub postcards. So, you know, it just depends on where you're selling and, and, and you know, how you look at this. Chris has the same mentality as I do. So again, subscribe if you haven't subscribed to Chris here. You know, we've still got 125 people watching. I only have 48 likes. So if we can get that like button up there, anybody who hasn't hit that like button, please, if you haven't went and seen Chris's page, please go see his page. Again, I don't have people on my show. You know that. You know, I, I'm giving you a guy that's like me, that I, I would trust 
personally, outside of, you know, YouTube and the whole works, you know, there's very few people that I do that with. And you all know that I've been on for over a year and I've only had one or two people on my whole, whole channel this whole time. So again, I, I'm recommending him for a reason. I'm recommending him because he does put out some good content. He's actually trying to fight the good fight. He works for the Cancer Society. He's not a joke. He's he's got right about the same, um, you know, subscriber base as I have. So again, he's a good guy. So you know, let's hear, uh, uh, shoot us out a word of wisdom for those who want to quit, Chris. Tell, tell them why they're, they're, they're totally off base on, on that one here. I mean, if you quit, you, you don't get any money. <laughs> so if you want to keep continue having a business, I mean, don't quit. I mean, you're going to, you're going to roll with the punches. You know, it's funny you mentioned about uh, being able to go back in the day and, and I wish I kept the uh, screenshots and all that kind of stuff too. I actually found some floppy disks from 2001. Uh, now, not the floppy disk that you and I know of the floppy disks that are the a drive disks, you know, the hard ones. Uh, I found a bunch of those that had eBay listings on them because before uh, the Sony Mavica, I'm, I don't know if you've ever heard of that camera before. Yeah, I, I, my, my neighbor got one. Back in the day, they take the, the standard floppy. Back in the day, those things used to cost like $1,000. And right. the first time I saw one, the neighbor who was doing eBay, he did it the same time we did. He would do the photographs. He'd take the photo. I had a cheapo junkie digital. Well, not cheap back then. It was still like three, 400 but uh, he would do that. And as soon as he got the, the Mavica or however you want to pronounce it, everything was on floppies. And I'm like, holy cow, because it literally takes the whole floppy in there. That was like a, that's the SD card of the day. You know, you're going from what's a two and a quarter down to a SD or a micro SD, which was kind of fascinating for me. So we have a uh, Charles Lowe in the chat saying everyone is not as knowledgeable or as experienced as you two. And I would say I agree. And here's the thing. What's so nice about we're, we're, Don and I grew up, we had to literally fail to learn. And what's nice about the the day that we live in, in this, the age of day, the, the day and age we live in now is you can go to YouTube, you can subscribe to Don, you can subscribe to us, you can learn from other resellers, you can buy amazing reference books. There's a lot of opportunity to learn a lot. So I would say like, not only that, you know, the people don't have an excuse today to, to have a successful bit business. There's lots of information out there that wasn't available to us uh, even 10 years ago, uh, let alone, you know, five, you know, there's lots of great information out there. So anyone could start, anyone could start learning. I have a learning kind of program that I do every year. This year, I'm starting to learn about glass and ceramics. And so maybe, so maybe you all want to learn something like that. So, so take something that you don't know and really go deep into that subject. And you do that enough over the year, over five years, over 10 years, you'll have a ton of knowledge too. Yeah, it's it's time in and I, I people just don't get that. I, I've done collectibles as Chris did since I was seven. I'm a little older than Chris, so I've got a few years up on him. But in general, in, in 1977 was when I did my first you know sale of anything. And I was a, a small child. I, I just graduated from kindergarten. I guess I would have been in first or second grade. Um, you know, that's when I started selling stuff. You know, I realized that I could scribble on a piece of paper and someone would give me a nickel or a, a dime for it, which again, nowadays doesn't sound like much, but you could actually go to a store and buy something with a nickel and a dime back there, back then in the day. <laughs> I think a candy bar back then on sale, you get for like 10 or 15 cents, like a Hershey's bar or something, if I'm not mistaken. A dime would buy you a pea shooter is what we used to go down and get. And it was a, a long straw with hard peas that would literally dent cars. And I can't believe they sold those back in the day, but I don't know if you remember those. Maybe they were banned before no or you but those are the kind of things that you could buy at a convenience store when i was a child you could buy a cherry bomb at a convenience store you know you had to be 18 i think maybe i don't even know if that's the case now but <laughs> that reminds me of uh that uh saturday night live skit of dan Aykroyd where he's like the toy salesman with the bag of glass bag of glass and, yeah. and johnny switchblade it. <laughs> yeah, Johnny, I, we just watched that the other day, honestly. I, I had to show that one to my kids. My my kids loved the uh, that, and I can't remember what the other one was, but it was it's actually a Fonzie doll, is Johnny Switchblade, if you look at it really closely. Right. I think yeah. the other one was a was a was a baby that wet itself or something like that. And something I think was something like that. <clears throat> and then they had the uh, the uh, the uh, chainsaw teddy bear, I think was one of them too. On that. <laughs> That's right. But, because he did uh, E. Buzz Miller's, um, he did another one on art, and he was the same basic character. I remember that one very well. That was that's one of my favorites. Yeah, it, the the times have changed. I mean, we used to go and we used to play cowboys and Indians. That shows you how old I am. 
Uh, we used to play cops and robbers outside with guns and toy guns and, and there was caps in them and they, they shot and they made noise. And, you know, you would never see that these days. And so, you know, times change. And so that's just a perfect point of eBay. Times change. You have to roll. You have to just go with the changes and, and do what you best you can do. Yeah, that brings me back to lawn darts. You know, I still <laughs> see those show up. I saw another one the other day and somebody's like, why can't you sell those on eBay? I'm like, yeah, because they were banned because too many people got speared by a long metal spike like that big. I, I still can't believe they had stuff like that. Now it's the uh, the toss in the little bean bags that, that they do and stuff. So um, anyway, I got some more questions. Well, let's actually open the house up to some questions yeah. here. Because and I see a bunch of questions. Don, I have no time limit, so we can go as long as you want. You let me know when we're done. Yeah, we started a little late, so we'll, we'll go some, some more. As long as you don't have a time limit there. Yep. Let's go up to the questions again. Everybody knows my feed is terrible. I'm going to try to get to the top of it, but it doesn't look like it'll even let me go up to the top. So <laughs> I th maybe start at the bottom and work your way up. Would yeah, <laughs> I, I thought about that, but usually when you're scanning up, it Mine disappears. My feed will just disappear, and then it'll randomly put me somewhere. That's so crazy. Like, yeah, it, yeah. it's done it's, this forever. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because you know, like as a as a guest now, you know, I get to see this live, and as a viewer, you know, I, I we all we're all like, you know, see you struggling trying to figure out where you were and everything. So this is very interesting. Yeah, it's not. I'm not used to doing this. So you guys are gonna have to give me some time here on this. I'm actually popping back. I've got too many screens open. I think's my problem. Um, too many, too many laptops sitting here, honestly. Uh, well, let's hop to a question here. Let me, uh, pop back over here. Um, let's see here. If you got a question, pop them in the bottom. Uh, let me pop down here. I know I saw a bunch, but yeah, hang on just a second here. I see we've got quite a few people in the house. We still have 133. Oh, wow. That's a lot, man. Uh, let's see here. SpongeBob. Yeah, somebody oh, talking man. about pension notice. Yeah, I, I, we get those in the mail now. Uh, I used to take pictures I, of ticket. I'm prices. still waiting to find a Walt Disney signature here somewhere. I know I'm going to find one in a book one of these days because that's another thing about living in Burbank is, you know, Walt was here. You know, he died at the hospital my kids were born at. Born at so, you know, there's a lot of history. And what's great about here is also the some of the garage sales. You can find some really uh, interesting things being in the media city. Yeah, I could imagine that as well. Um, I've been to, um, obviously, California before. I, I worked in Whittier for, uh, I don't know if you know where Whittier is, but I, I, I flew in. Yeah, I figured you probably did. Um, I was in that general area for a little while working for, I worked for Einstein Brothers, which was a national uh, bagel company, and I was a regional, and I used to fly out and do training, and um, it was a USDA facility, and there was a major uh, bagel factory that they owned in Whittier. So I'd go out there and, and do a, um, it was called a HAZAP inspection, Hazard Analysis of Critical Control Points. It's a food-based safety uh, thing. You got to take classes for it. I was certified through the University of Maryland in the whole work. So, you know, it was it was a long ordeal. But um, I, I liked my time in California, but I didn't get to see anything, unfortunately. It was just yeah. pretty much work and running around and, and stuff like that. Um, hang on one second so, here. So I, I, actually, I actually got a question here I can pull from you real quick. Sure. You uh, can probably see it better than I can because I've I, got Google and everything else open yeah, up. No problem. So uh, Rosanna N asks, uh, always allow returns with a question mark. So I'm thinking she's she wants to know like how we do our returns. Now for me personally, I do returns, but they have to pay for shipping. That's how I do my business here. Uh, the American Cancer Society, we don't do returns. Uh, that's been our policy uh, ever before I got here. And so we continue to do that policy. Um, does it affect our business? Maybe. Uh, we still sell stuff, but you know, if, you know, long term, we will have to do more studies on it to see if that actually affects our business. But for my personal eBay store, I do, I accept returns 60 days with, uh, they pay for shipping. Yeah. On, on our side, um, free returns on everything. I've, I've done it that way since they did it. I like to keep my top rated seller plus. And again, people say it's not much, but you know, it's thousands of dollars for me a year in, in credits, you know, I get the credit, I get the fee off. So, you know, I, I would always keep my top rated seller plus. Um, if it means I do the free returns, that's what I did. When they changed it to um, 30 day you had to do, I did 30 day. I almost never have a return. And I literally almost never, I don't do clothes anymore. So 
Um, you know, antiques and collectibles, my it's just a couple of scans or a couple of photos. They can see the defects. Everything's listed. I, I honestly, I can't tell you when the last time I had a return. I took one yesterday. I didn't have to. It was a lady who actually wanted to upgrade something. I got a new card up. She bought the old one from me, which had some damage. So I told her she could upgrade it. So I wouldn't call that a return. She's actually sending the card back to me and she's going to spend $12 more on a better card. So that's my last return that I can tell you about. I don't remember the last one besides that. Um, I had one like phony one that um, eBay sided with me and I didn't even have to mess with it. The person got stuck with it. So, you know, eBay said that's the way it goes. My opinion personally, um, it depends on what you sell. If you got clothing, you're going to have to, to judge that on your own. I don't do clothing. So, and I hate clothing these days. Um, <laughs> Me too. Why, why mess with something I don't like? Everything I do now, I like. I don't have to deal with the other stuff. I didn't like clothing. It was my way to get into the industry to sell. If I didn't do clothing, I don't know what I would have done because I didn't have any any links or ways or, or know-how at the time when I first started years back to get into eBay with, with collectibles. I'd always done them, but I didn't, didn't think about it and get into it as I should. So uh, we strayed away. I would do free returns if it was me personally. Again, everybody has, has their own reasons. I can promise you, though, that I don't have returns. And I sell... I won't give you away my sales, but, but let's just say <laughs> average week, you know... Um, I'll, I'll, last week we did 4,200 on the store I share it with you. Last oh, wow. Week, just the store I share it with you. Um, I'm going to post a few. You, you're you in my, uh, Chris is actually in my Patreon group. I did show you $1,100 day, um, and that's typical on many days. Um, three days ago, we sold uh, one card for 750 um, You know, th that's a typical week for me. That's just the store I share with you. So I don't, with that amount of sales and that amount of money, I don't have returns. I'm no BS, no nothing. I don't have returns. So it would be a no brainer to accept the returns. I honestly feel that it gives you a boost in your sales. Again, I can completely understand why the American Cancer Society would not want to do it because it's a charitable event. You know, there's more to it than that. So again, it, it's going to depend on what you sell. If you sell clothing, you, you, I wouldn't do it because you're going to end up people trying it on, as they say. You know, the, the return rate on clothing, somebody told me it was like 22%, but I don't know if that's true because, again, I don't mess with it. I, I stopped studying anything with clothing once we, we dumped it. So, you know, that's just my take on it. Um, again, my feeds are all over the place. No, so that's okay. You know what? You Let's talk about this. You, you did actually bring up a good point that I want to talk about is when I first started eBay, I, I lived in a one-bedroom apartment. I didn't have very much room. And you can literally store like, what, 500 postcards in one of those little tiny tubs? So I always suggest when people are starting to get into eBay is start to sell things that are, uh, that are small, you know, like baseball cards, coins, your, you know, co uh, comic books, you know, something, well, not comic books. They're kind of actually funky to, to ship, but, uh, just kind of small things. And you comic talk about books are easy to ship. Yeah. But what I'm saying is for, for a new person that, you know, they might not know that you should probably put some hard backing behind it, not just put it in a bubble. Oh, no, and, we put a, and send comic it off. Books Comic books from us, uh, interrupt you for just one second. Comic books from us, they go in the same piece of cardboard I mail everything in. It goes just like a magazine. Every single magazine or, or thing I go, everything goes in ca on cardboard. I've never had one ruined in my entire life. But let let take back off there, Chris. No, no, no. I was just saying, so like, I think there's a lot of that kind of information that, uh, you know, a lot of new sellers might not know is, you know, they might think just putting it a comic book in a bubble mailer with just the 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 backer and the and the the board and the plastic might be good enough, but those things are going to get smashed. And I saw your video on how you ship that kind of stuff, and it's awesome because you're not really paying for bubbles. You're basically just cutting a box and using the box as a shipping device, which is genius when you really think about it. Do you want to explain that to the guests that might not have seen that video? Well, on on stuff like that. Um, I I'll just run by what, how I pay for my shipping supplies. I don't pay for them. I bill everybody for shipping. I don't care if it's a postcard. And again, Chris is 100% right. Postcards are the easiest thing to mail out. I've, If I could show you right now, I've got just a ton of stuff here. But postcards fit in a small area, easy to ship out. With the cardboard I get and stuff, I charge the folks the full-fledged, full price. So let's say they're buying a postcard. It's $350 or I think it's $374 is the cheapest postcard price now. I charge them that price. It cost me less than, than that to actually mail it. That cost, the difference, covers my eBay fees on my shipping and all the supplies to mail it out. I take a Walmart, well, Walmart's changing their boxes, but it's a 14-inch 
uh, by 14 inch square cube box. And I cut those down and that goes for 90% of what I ship from the store I share with you can be shipped in that, that one box. Again, I'm not paying for it. So all those folks who throw in shipping, I know if, if it's free shipping, the shipping's calculated in there. I don't know how many times I've had people tell me they've messed up on that. Um, they, they've given it away too cheap or uh, offer came in and they let go too cheap or they were wrong on shipping. Um, I just charge for everything. Um, and cardboard goes on everything. I ship out books and cardboard. I wrap it with cardboard around every single thing I go. Every single item that's shipped is also sealed in plastic. Everything. I don't care what it is because maybe it's not much to you. Maybe it's a $2 or $5 postcard to you that you're selling it. But to somebody else, that could be the item that, that was burned up in a fire that they haven't seen in 50 years. It could be a memento they're going to give to their grandfather or something that used to live in a building. Everything I send out, I consider a piece of treasure, a piece of art, a piece of history that somebody is going to cherish when they get. And I get comments all the time that my father used to work there or my great, great grandfather owned this place. When you sell vintage like I do in, in the quantity that I do, a lot of people buy stuff for a last name on it. So I consider every single piece I get a relic. A, a, a piece of art, a historical artifact, and I treat it with care. So everything goes on. I don't care if it's a, a 99 cent piece of paper, it's gonna get wrapped in plastic. They're gonna pay for it, and, and that's literally the way I go. So if you haven't seen the videos on that, you know, check it out. You know, Chris has got a ton of videos as well, too. We're pretty much tied um, across the board on videos and time on and the whole works. He's almost a clone of me to some extent, I guess you could say. <laughs> that is true. We have a lot in common, dude. It's actually pretty scary. Yeah, our history goes right back to each other. Same time frame, same everything. He's touched with Disney. Uh, you know, I've touched with Disney. Um, you know, I've done some toy stuff. He's done some toy stuff. You know, we've we've worked for people. We've done our own thing. You know, we're married. I think Chris has a son and a daughter as well. Is that correct? Just the two of you? They're two yep. kids. Yeah, so, two kids. Uh, We've got two kids as well, so you know, we're we're on the opposite coast almost. But I mean, other than that, it would be nice to meet and you know, uh, shoot the uh, you know what you would say. But you know, we're, yeah, we're doing sure. it this way. Yeah. So I want a question for you. See, I ship my. Someone was asking about shipping uh, postcards. Now I ship mine in a top loader, a five by seven with the pot with the poly or with the bubble mailer, and that seems to have been fine for me. How do you? Re what do you recommend for shipping? Uh, postcards this is what i do so what do you what do you usually do i wouldn't do the top loaders because it's more money personally yeah. you know I, I buy them i still have top loaders like um that 750 card is going to go in a top loader and it's going to go in three pieces of the cardboard i send out and something else i don't spend the money on it even though i do charge for it i just literally put them in the, the um what it's it's uh 3.75 by uh what's it 5.75 um the the little clear um sleeves that they go in that's what i put it oh, in right. And then it goes between a standard cheap postcard goes between um, it's a triple fold on the card stock, the cardboard stock. So there's three pieces of cardboard around this thing. I've never had one uh, mangled at all. Usually the size of the package helps to make sure that doesn't happen. So, you know, it, again, it, it's a postcard. The video pretty much explains it. It's it's hard to say if, if it's, again, a high dollar one, say hundred, two, three, four hundred dollars $400, it's going to go in a top loader. But for the most part, I don't use them. now. When I send out my own artwork postcards, everyone goes in a sleeve and everyone goes in a top loader because I, I want to make sure that that's you know going somewhere and they understand that I spent the extra time on it. You know what? I, I actually I actually want to thank you uh, also for for getting me back into postcards. I I used to be in them a little bit. I was never heavy into postcards. I knew of them. I knew they made money, but I want to thank you, man, because your video when you started talking about real postcards, a real photo postcards. Uh, I learned a lot about that stuff. And th those are like some of the top tier postcards when it comes to money. Uh, what kind of subjects do you think in, in real photo postcards do very well, like subject wise? Subject wise is easy. Um, baseball, you know, anything baseball. The, I, I got a way back old video uh, six months ago or something. The, the highest price ever sold on a, or highest price uh, paid for a postcard was a Babe Ruth and it went for a couple hundred thousand dollars. You know, um, it, you're not going to see that every day, but on eBay, like a Tahoe card can go from two to four thousand um, dollars. Old baseball players, um, Babe Ruth, Ty Cobb, something like that on a baseball card goes for a ton. You're in the best place in the country for postcards. Uh, yeah. California cards go higher than anything else in this country. 
California is the hottest um, means of postcards you can find right now. It's, it's California or bust on me for pretty much everything. Um, obviously, Hong Kong cards sell as well, or China cards in general. Train depots. Um, I had a Titanic uh, postcard. I got like six for that. So those go very well. Um, disaster uh, postcards. Um, there's a few that I won't touch. I won't do any of the lynchings or anything like that. I think that's yeah. really awful. Uh, sure. Bad topic, bad taste. I think eBay should ban them um, in my book. But those are the key ones that, that I personally have had in this area. Um, for you, I know you've, you sell a lot of the toys. Um, can you maybe uh, elaborate maybe on the, the difference between a, a low dollar Funko? Because I know you do Funkos. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, and, and Dunnies in general. Because that question was actually asked. Um, and I figured you'd be the guy to answer that. I don't mess with them very much. I've got some sure. little minis from Rick and Morty and stuff like that. But if a person's looking to do it with, I think Funko's coming to eBay, if I'm not mistaken, <clears throat> or one of the companies that does it is coming to eBay. So with, right. with all that in mind, what would it be? What, what would somebody look for, for actually getting those? I mean, where are you going to start off with that for somebody who doesn't know vinyl toys at all? Sure. And this is a very, this is a very hard question to answer because it, it comes down to knowing the characters and knowing what is rare and what's not. Uh, for those who don't know, a lot of these things, other than Funkos, Funkos come in, in a box and you can usually look those up very easily. A lot of the ones that are rare are usually the older ones that are vaulted. Uh, the term is vaulted. So like, let's say there's something that is retired we the word retired is usually thrown around in the community a lot more than vaulted so vaulted is something that is very funko specific and so uh you want to look them up uh the thing is a lot of these little figures they come in blind boxes for those that don't know a blind box is a basically like a box you buy that you don't know what's inside it other than you can look on the side of the box to see what different figures are in the set and some of those are called chasers and they're they come maybe one a case or one every three cases. And those can sometimes go for 20, 30, 40, 100, 200 dollars. Now the thing is you have to know your stuff. It's not just something like uh if you look at this thing and it's blue and it's like three inches tall, that's worth money. It's not that easy. It's literally have to know everything. For Funko Pops, just look them up. Uh, one of the best tips I can give to anyone, real quick tips on Funko Pops is uh look at the little circle, look at the little stickers that are in, on the window. Your average pop is not going to have a sticker. The chasers have stickers. The limited editions have stickers. But what's nice about Funko Pops, they give you the name right on the front and a number. So you can just look that up very easily. There's stuff that Disney put out uh, when Funkos first came out. And I kick myself for not buying these because I saw them and I thought they were junk. Some of the older Disney ones go for hundreds of dollars, $400, $500. Now, these are just the regular ones that were sold in the store. So is that still in the box? They do need to be in the box or can you yeah, still sell so those? You can still sell those out of the box. Um, so let's say you had a, a figure that was worth $500, let's say, and it came with a box and the box is in mint condition. That figure out of the box might still be worth three to $400, maybe even less. So the box actually uh, in some cases has a very dramatic price on the, on the figure. I sold a Tupac figure that I had put away that I was going to do a custom uh, like three or four years ago, I pulled it out of uh, storage and I looked it up. I got $250 for just a loose Funko Pop figure of Tupac Shakur. So like I said, it's very hard to, to give you a straight answer of the question that you just asked, other than you should just research whatever you can to figure it out if it's worth anything. That's that's a good point. Again, none of this works without research. Um, if you are on gated on Amazon, um, I'm, I'm going to relate to somebody's question here that was not related to this because we're talking about this. If you're trying to sell um, like a Funko Pop on, let's say, Amazon and it lets you list it, but it's a vintage one or something and it's out of the box. Even if it lets you list it, that doesn't mean you should list it. Um, just FYI on Amazon. Um, just because we're talking about Funkos, a lot of the stuff, whether it's in the box or out of the box, you, you have to be very specific where you list it. You're safe on eBay for anything. So if you want the best place to list an out of the box Funko, technically it's Amazon, but you're probably not going to be on gated and vintage collectibles. So you may not have that ability to do that. Just FYI. Um, I don't remember who that was that asked that, but that was one of the questions. So. Again, know your platforms as well when you're doing this. As Chris is saying here, you've got to look this stuff up. And I tell people that all the time. I'll get people sending me a photo saying, I just bought all this for 10 bucks. What do you think it's worth? <laughs> you know, 
I wouldn't have bought it for 10 bucks if I didn't know it was worth at least 10 bucks. Right. You know, um, rule of thumb is, you know, I don't, if, I, if I'm spending a dollar, I sure as heck hope to get at least 10 back out of that dollar. That's just rule of thumb. I mean, I, I don't, I don't play around with my, my money. Even if it's a dollar item, I still almost always look it up. You know, like if I'm going to buy a, a 5,000 records or something, which we do, you know, a couple times a month, I'll buy anywhere from say four to 10,000 45s. 45s are where I make a ton of money at. I look through every single lot until I know I'm going to make my money back from, from that. And if it takes me a whole bunch to look through it, chances are I'm not going to want to buy the lot because it took that long and it means it's a lot of work. So again, don't buy anything, whether it's Funko Pops, a huge lot of Funko Pops without, as Chris says as well, everybody who, who's going to tell you that's going to tell you, you need to look them up. Don't buy the stuff if you haven't looked it up. I don't care how good of a deal it looks. Let's say you see 1,078 records for 50 bucks. You may spend so much time in looking those up to find out that somebody's picked through them. You've got gas, you've got weight, then you got to do something with all the ones that won't sell. Price, cheapness doesn't mean anything when it comes to stuff like that. No matter what it is you're buying, you've got to look it all up. Now, me or Chris, maybe we don't have to look up a lot of stuff because we've we've looked it up a thousand times the same item. You know, if it's a postcard, I'm pretty darn good and, and can pretty much tell you if it's got some value to it. If it's a vintage trade card, Chris, I'm sure is the same way with comics and, and video games. I'm not up on video games as much as Chris. Chris has got some really good video games or um, uh, videos on video games as well, too. So, again, check that channel out if you get a chance because Chris just has some really good videos on that stuff that stuff that I don't touch. I play the games. We've sold vintage NES and the whole works, but I don't, I'm not up on them. The only ones I know are like the Olympics ones that are gold that they custom oh, made and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I've seen one in person, wasn't lucky enough to get it. You know, I, I watched somebody pay 250 on one and thought that was way oh, too much. Yeah. And then I looked it up and I'm like, oh man, you know, but I didn't know, you know, you, you don't know unless you look the stuff up. I learned my lessons years ago that I don't buy anything without looking it up. And if I think maybe that's too much, I'm definitely going to look it up because maybe I'm wrong. And maybe that 250 on that, that cartridge would have been a steal, which obviously it was because it went for over a thousand at the time I passed it up for 250, you know, not knowing, figuring, you know, most of them are about the same, you know, that's just a play on that. Yeah, well, for how, sure. What, what's your area that you sell the most? And I guess would, would lead us to that question there. Um, wow. That's actually a really good question. I, I mean, I guess collectibles. I mean, I do sell a lot of video games and, uh, in 2001, in, in that in that kind of area and time, I had a website that was actually a price guide for uh, Nintendo and Super Nintendo games. I was heavy into that collection, and um, so I had a lot to to do with that. And I sold I sold that collection like way too early. I didn't realize that things were going to go as crazy as they did. I always thought of video games were going to be the next baseball cards, and here we are, 2019, and they're doing the same thing. Uh, retro games are super super hot right now. Uh, Nintendo, Super Nintendo, you know, uh, even some of the 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 earlier PlayStation things, so, but Nintendo is super hot. You know, even some of the Sega stuff. Uh, it's crazy to think like some of the prices of stuff that's going for now, and that just comes to nostalgia. It's going to come around again, and in, in the next twenty years, the key is, uh, and we've talked about this before, is the key is trying to figure out what's going to be the hot thing ten years from now that's out right now, very, very you know, available right now because all this collections and collectors items they run in cycles you know so five years from now ten years from now there's going to be something that's out right now that you could buy for super cheap that's going to go for a hundred dollars but we don't know what it is that's the my that's little the ponies part. you think so custom my little ponies <laughs> look up look up custom my little pony i saw one go for seventy eight hundred dollars and it was one that somebody made in their garage Oh man, was so, it the you know, was it the carbonite one? Have you seen that one? No, this was a plush. This was somebody oh. sewed a plush out in their garage studio, and it went for seventy eight hundred dollars. Whoa! Yeah, it's just a plush toy, custom made. Uh, My Little Ponies are hot. They've been hot for a long time, so that one kind of surprised me too. Elongated pennies, we as we were talking about before, some of those I've seen going for almost a thousand dollars for some of those. So yeah. Just FYI. It's crazy. it's crazy. You know, what's funny is like, uh, I've never, here's the, here's the most funny part about that whole situation. I've never heard of elongated pennies. I've always heard them called press pennies, but you swear that they're called uh, elongated pennies. And, and so it's kind of funny. I, I think maybe that might be an East coast and West coast thing. That could think? be type up elongated pennies on, um, on, uh, uh, eBay and you're going to get to see exactly what I'm talking about because literally that's the title on most all of them that I see up there on eBay longigated pennies and I, I'm almost sure that says that as the category name on, on eBay um, I'll have to look this up for sure 
Yeah, you'll have to take a look on that. Um, one other thing I'm, I'm going to shoot out here too, um, as, as Chris was talking about, and me as well, terms that people use all the time that don't mean anything, rare or scarce. I don't know <laughs> how many times I see somebody put scarce in something, and it's something I could, well, not literally, but I could probably almost walk down to the convenience store and, and find the same item. You know, those are thrown around way, way too much. Rare and scarce, um, like, let's say it's rare. Rare means that there's, you know, let's say it's a postcard. There's probably less than 10 of those ever around or that you would ever find if it's rare. Scarce, maybe 100. So if, if there's 100 of them up on eBay, it's not rare, scarce, or anything. It's just there. So, and that's one of the ones I've had somebody say and ask me before, should I put scarce in the title? No, don't put scarce in the title. Don't put rare in the title. All those terms are, are just, um, they don't mean anything. You know, when somebody's searching for something on eBay, they're not going to type in the word rare to search up anything. They're going to exactly. type in RPPC. They're not going to use the word rare. They're not going to use the word scarce. Those mean absolutely nothing. 10 years ago, yeah. 10 years ago, you, if you put rare or scarce, it would have called attention to it. Not anymore because everybody does it. So everybody in their right mind should stop using those two words. I've only used that word probably in maybe one out of 10,000 titles. And it was something that, you know, sold for a couple thousand bucks. So it could qualify. Um, I usually just put holy grail. Um, that's the term that most, if, if you're a record guy like me, holy grail is what you'll find. Type in holy grail in any record section out there and you're going to see holy grail records. There's actually, um, uh, let's see, what's it called? I think Craig Moyer's site, which is a big record guy. Um, it used to be on his page. There's a, a million dollars worth of 45s. It's, it's literally just a list of 45s that equals a million dollars. And it's, it's not many 45s, let's just put it that way, considering that it's a million freaking dollars for crying out loud. So, you know, <laughs> that whole list is rare. You know, um, we've sold records that there's only like four known copies of. You know, those are rare. Those are $4,000 records. Those are $10,000 records. Like um, uh, Junior McCant, there's, uh, again, most people probably don't know who Junior McCant is, but on Zebra, there's a Zebra record that's worth $12,000. Wolverton Orchestra. That's somebody else probably doesn't know who that is. Bix uh, Bidecker or Bidenecker, isn't it? That's, you know, $20,000 record or for some of those. Robert Johnson, $20,000. Those are all rare. Most everything else, you're not going to find a rare action figure unless you have like um, Snaggletooth from the JCPenney's Cantina set or something. Oh, I know, you know Chris is laughing. That. You know about that, huh? That, yeah, that of course shows, I know about that, that one. That shows you uh, your depth of Star Wars figures knowledge. I know sure. my Star Wars. I've got the catalog. I owned every single Star Wars figure, including the last 17, if that gives you an idea. Oh, and I, I owned, it. I've sold them all. I've, I've even had all the droids and the um, all the um, uh, Ewok uh, cartoons as well, too, because there's the, the fish guy from, um, uh, I think it's Ewoks or droids. There's two versions of him. There's a version of him that's actually oh, in the yeah. standard set. I think it's Glicks. Glick, that's exactly right. He's got a tie and a suit on in the whole works and a fish head. First time I saw him, I didn't know he was a Star Wars character. And I passed him by and found out that he was worth like $1,000. There's yeah, two versions of him. One version is from the set, the last 17, and the other version is from the cartoon. You want the one from the set and not the cartoon, but they're both worth like $500 a piece minimum and junk crudded out condition with the paint gone and everything else so yeah those are rare the rest of the stuff everybody tells you are not rare there's some rare cards and a few other things but there's not many specifics like that that are just that scarce um you know like a like one of the the um the, the price change covers on like uh star wars comic book number one there's there's a variant copy as you know there's what the 30 cent is that i think the first one and the other one's 35 cent one of those uh, goes that sounds about right yeah i'm pretty sure that's what it is one of those goes for like Four hundred dollars, and that could be considered rare because it was only released in, let's say, on on the Pacific Coast. All the other ones out of the whole set, though, you know, are pretty much useless. Not useless, but you know, not worth a ton unless you're getting them graded and they're grading at like a nine point four or higher. I I like comics, so I mean, I'm into that stuff too. So yeah, that's a whole other subject in itself. Grading that sure has changed the industry big time over the last ten years. Yeah, grading's a big one. We got 173 watchers. Can we wow. get more likes out of that? I only have 77. Wow. That's a lot, so, man. Yeah, that's that's. 
probably about, I guess, average. Once a month, I'll get a real big one like this. And then I think it's day of the week, too. So I'm glad everybody made it today because we do have a good full house <laughs> today. So I wasn't sure. And we had talked about a day to do this. So it's kind of hard to judge on other channels and, and, you know, people pulling from my feed and stuff to watch other channels. Again, I'm not everybody's favorite. And I don't really, you know, that's everybody has their own choices for who they watch. So, you know, we try to give out honest, legit information. I'm not going to tell you you can sell 50 pairs of jeans and you're going to make $10,000 a month. That's the, <laughs> anybody who's telling you, all you got to do is sell a certain amount of anything. Don't watch them anymore. Turn those guys off because there's just, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Chris, can I just sell 50 of anything and I'm going to be rich? Uh, not unless it's like 50 gold bars. Well, yeah, that's <laughs> about it. But what's your cost in a 50 gold bars to begin with? So, you know, I know maybe you found them. You stumbled on them in a state sale. I yeah. They're the, bricks. <laughs> yeah, I, that would be a nice thing to find. I mean, the, the most gold I found, we were at a um, like a secondhand place in Florida, in Claremont, Florida, and uh, they had some uh, spurs, um, sprues, and it turned out it was like big chunks of gold, and I got like an ounce of, of um, 18 karat gold in this thing for 50 bucks. You know, they hadn't a clue what it was, but I took the chance on it. I could have lost, but, you know, we ended up getting like a thousand bucks in gold out of it, so... You know, you asked earlier, like, what are big sellers here in the store? Um, gold sells through very fast. We have actually a couple of uh, people that have emailed me and said, anytime we get that stuff in to email them. And so, uh, gold's a very, very good thing that sells through very fast, obviously, because it's got, you know, it's intrinsic value and it's value for weight. Uh, also, another pro tip is a lot of vintage gold isn't stamped, it isn't Hallmark. So, just 100%. Be, yeah. So, just be, be, that helps actually helps us as resellers is there's a lot of people that don't know what they're doing and you can go to a garage sale or a state sale, usually not a state sale. Those people are pretty knowledgeable, but you still can find that stuff. But what I'm saying is a lot of the old gold vintage antique gold isn't marked. So you might be able to come across that stuff. Yeah. I, I think before 1890 something, they didn't mark it. Um, we're one of the carriers that I find more golden and everybody passes it by earring backs and i know it sounds oh, sounds yeah. ridiculous they're 14 karat we buy in big bulk lots sometimes i'll buy 50 pounds of gold colored jewelry that supposedly i'll look through and just you know scrappers and stuff i don't know how many times i've you know gotten an eighth of an ounce or you know a quarter of an ounce in just the earring backs that were solid 14 karat gold i mean yeah 10 of them doesn't add up to a lot but when you get a whole bunch of them um, I do very well. We scrap gold. Usually we wait till we have two or three ounces and then we go to the same guy every time because in every city, if you do gold scrap, there's usually one big store that buys it from everybody else. They're usually the biggest jeweler in town. Um, they have, you know, their own melting facilities, which the one I go to does and he'll buy it higher than everybody else. The other people sell it to him, as I said. So if you call around and you're scrapping gold, call around to everybody who's on that top of the list and find out what they're paying on spot. You got to do it at the exact same day within an hour. So because the price fluctuates so much, you don't want to be getting wrong answers. So call them all right off the bat on one specific day. That's the one rule of thumb that I've always found. Like uh, with Chris, I'm sure um, like before our savers closed down, I would take a loop in the savers, you know, and I know many other people took a loop in the savers just to check out their cabinets up there. When they come in to buy the gold, Chris, um, are they bringing a loop or anything like that in there to, to check it no, out? No, I sell on eBay. The oh. eBay sales I'm talking about, the stuff that we have, a, we have a lady that's here that is our jewelry specialist, and uh, she's very good at spotting a lot of that stuff. But I have gold testing stuff here too. Uh, also, I have my loop. And by the way, if you're ever going to get a loop, make sure you get one with a light on it. It's yeah, have, yeah. I got a link to a lighted one right down below because that's the best ones you can get. There you go. I mean, I can't tell you how many times the light has really helped uh, with the loop because you can get a loop that it doesn't have a light and whatever you have to have the proper lighting, but the ones with the light and this one actually has two different things. So if you can go to the link below to Don's link, definitely check that out. These are, this is a must have every reseller should have one of these in a magnet in their car. I also got one of those uh, rare earth magnet. Yeah, I got one too. Yeah, yeah. I got one too. Yep. So these are the two things that every reseller must have in their collection for sure i not only have i've i bought a case well not a case it was like 24 1930s bakelite bosch and i mean, i've said something about it before but i got one of those in my car in the side pocket in my car in the center console i usually keep one in my pocket there's one next to i can see like four right now i've got them everywhere there is always a loop in here and if there's not a loop i have 
no, 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 nothing's where I want it to be when I want to grab it. <laughs> it's uh, like a magnifier glass. You can just pop on something and it, it lights up. Right. It, it's like a right. table table thing. Now my bees. Yeah, there. there you go. You should be fine. But yeah, no, no I'm, I'm, lucky, I'm lucky because I'm here like, uh, what do you call it? I'm, I'm at my, my work desk, so I have easily accessible to all this stuff. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Uh, the, the camera got out of focus. But uh, yeah, so, you know, that's just one of the things. And everyone's got to have a fidget box, too, on their desk because, you know, I fidget throughout the day. So you definitely got to have one of those. Do you have an automatic focus on your camera? Did it just whack out? Yeah, it is. It does that once in a blue moon. There it's you a go. brio. It's You're a back. brio. So if I move too too quickly and the light's not just quite right, it, it does that here. And everyone's got to have a Chewbacca mug on their desk, too. You yeah, I had one of those. Um, <laughs> when I worked at Disney, we could get those at discount. And usually there was a place called uh, Bargain Basement. And it was only open to employees. And for, you know, uh, 10 cents on the dollar, you'd get anything you wanted in that place that was in the in the facility. So it was a huge plus. So I ended up getting one of those, too. We ended oh. up selling it, of course. Yeah, well, the funny part is my wife got this for free because she uh, just had a, another internship, not an internship, uh, a temp job there. And uh, what's nice is they give, they have a boxes now. Well, I don't know if they've had this where, where you're at, but where she works, they have boxes of stuff that's free. You can no. look at their samples and they literally give them, give them away for free with the caveat that you cannot sell them. So that's the thing. So. Well, well, Disney is busting down on employees. When we worked there as an employee, you could go in and use your discounts and things like that, but you had to be there with whoever you got into the park that day. Obviously, if it's just you going in, they didn't, didn't watch it, but they've been busting down on people doing that, and they didn't give anything away at Disney. You couldn't even eat a single fry to see if they were hot or salted right <laughs> unless you were given permission. That's... You know, you're laughing, but I'm serious. That's how, <laughs> oh, strict, I know. That's how strict they were there. They, they literally nothing got eaten. Now I worked there for a long time and I was, a, a, you know, management and stuff. So we have a lot of stuff that you technically shouldn't have. Um, you know, it was just stuff that you acquired. I mean, I even had parts of rides. Even at one point I had a oh, fish man. from a fish from 20,000 leagues, the, the sea, the, the, the it used to be hung underwater. You can still see the oh. chain hooks. I had an arm from one of the small world dolls and things like that too. I still so have, we, I was going to say, do you have any of that stuff left? That's amazing. No, I know where the fish is now right now, though, but I don't have any of it personally. I know I, I gave the fish away when we moved because it was space and the thing weighed like 25 pounds. It's just a big hunk of rubber with a, a metal um, frameature in it. And it's got a hole for a, a steel rod that would have went out. And that was what made it move the steel rod up and down or whatever. Yeah, it my so. dad told me when he when he was young, uh, they actually had real mermaids at the Disneyland one. Uh, that were kind of floating around in the submarine ride. So, you know, that's that's pretty cool. You know, like a lot of that Disney stuff, there's people that uh, sell actually parts like that on eBay. There's a couple of, I think they're Walt Disney World, uh, not official Walt Disney World, but I don't know how they get these things. There's, You know what I'm talking about. There's a warehouse. What well, you're talking, you're probably talking about bargain basement and stuff. We had, we bought things that were only for Disney. Um, One of our Christmas trees for Geez, like three years was this monstrous tree. You'd never know it wasn't real. And we bought it for 10 bucks at Bargain Basement. And it used to be one of the, the um, it was like a 12 foot tree. Um, and it was one of the ones that was featured in the uh, Christmas display display at Disney Village. And it was the main Christmas tree run, which it, I don't know if you know Disney World at all, but there's the Disney Village used to have the main Christmas shop there during during winter season. And it was literally a tree that we had seen. It's it, The thing was just awesome. But this was one custom made for Disney. I was told the thing cost like $2,200 new. Um, and once in a while you could get like... Um, there's a shop called Sid Quangas at, at Disney MGM Studios. And that's a prop shop and a like um, they sell stills and lobby cars and stuff. And once in a while, some of that stuff would be damaged and you could go down to the uh, bargain basement and get it. And one time there was something there that I couldn't afford, which is the only time I couldn't afford it. And it was one of the scoopy things from Tron, one of the props. It was it was like four hundred dollars there with the original tag on it of like, you know, forty two hundred dollars or some insane amount of money. Uh, but I would have loved to have had it. But at the time, we didn't have the money. So right. obviously, but we did get some things. I got some Bank of Zamundo bills with Eddie Murphy's face on it and stuff like that. And <laughs> we got some props from Blade Runner and a few other movies that were there that we we're lucky enough to get to the bargain basement. But I, I used to buy stills and lobby cards from there. And then we turn around and crank them out on eBay. You know, that's what we did with them because 10 cents on the dollar, you know, so I thought right. that was pretty interesting.
Yeah, Disney pins are pretty hot. We've I've sold those for ever since they came out, and I think it was like 1999 is when they first started to 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 be popularized. Even though they had some of the like weird uh, ones from in the 80s, but yeah, do you sell any Disney pins? Yeah, we as I said, I still have friends that work at Disney. Yeah. One one of my friends is um, head of the uh, purchasing department for uh, merch for the Magic Kingdom, so I get dibs on a lot of stuff like that. They do get promos to them but they don't oh, get wow. with the regular employees they'll do like a test run where there'll be a different color mm. when i worked there when they were just coming out they they officially started giving them to the employees to hand out in say 96 i would want to say um yeah probably in that range 96 is i started at disney in like 90 or 91 and um and like 96 i think is the first official date and then they gave out lanyards for folks I've touched on the 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 buttons or the pins and buttons as well in occasion here. I got a guy that sends me them right now. So oh, nice. when they've got a limited run of them, or you know, they only issued a thousand or a hundred or something like that. Once in a while, he's lucky enough to to pick up a big chunk of them, um, or like the the prints um, that they do. They they when uh, Euro Disney opened up, they did a castle print that they were selling to the employees for ten bucks. And that same day, it was on eBay for I don't got a thousand or something, some horrendous amount of money, and Goodness. we scored out on those, and you know yeah. paid off for a car with those, honestly. So, you know that's the kind of thing that I'm used to there. Um, in general, you know, Disney doesn't give out anything. You know, uh, Disney was, uh, you have a different experience from it because you, you're in a different line. But I worked in the park system. Um, no employee, hourly employee, got anything. I don't care what it was. They at least paid 10 cents on the dollar, if nothing else, even if it was junk and not worth a dime, you know, that's just yeah. their experience of it. Yeah. We, that we have the local uh, campus down the street I was talking about here and uh, the, the wed and the Imagineering are based out of there and they have a, 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 a employee store uh, that's open to the public every once in a while they have special events and there's like some pretty amazing limited edition pins that come out of there. But you're talking about the promos, man, that's a whole other level of money and value for sure. I I've had lucky, uh, or I've been lucky enough to get a few of the really rare ones that, you know, there's only a handful of made. Um, I actually have somebody who buys those straight out for me. We work for Disney for, you know, as I said, 10 years. So I've got a list of people these days that have kept in contact with me or that we've known for years, including a couple of people who work there with us um, for as long as we have. Uh, and they usually get dibs on stuff like that. I mean, put those kind of stuff up on eBay. It's just a quick turnover. And by the time I would, you know, put it up in the fees and all that, you know, like in a thousand dollar pin or something, you know, I just crank it out for a set price. And, you know, I got deals with people. I'm sure you've, you've got or had some issues like that in the past too, but I run out and we do like um, some mail order catalogs occasionally too. I do mail order on some specific movie related items like lobby car stills, Disney pins and stuff like that. And then I do 45s and 78s to a small group of people. Um, those are, you know, good money. I don't talk a lot about that kind of stuff because there's no real ins or outs in it. I've just done this for, you know, that kind of stuff for, you know, 10 plus years. So I've had the same people on those lists for all these years. I don't openly offer or anything else like that, but those items sell as soon as I get them in, they're gone. I don't care if it was in for two minutes, I could probably have it gone. The minute I send a picture to somebody, you know, with no eBay, you know, and that's with a lot of items that we sell, not a lot, but you know, a lot of those type of items, the Disney, the specific collectibles and things like that too. So Anyway, that's about the gist on that. Um, let me go through here. I think I had one more quick question that I wanted to go with. Um, and probably can't find it now that I really wanted to ask you. It. <laughs> right. I said I got a ton of notes. I wasn't kidding. Um, let, me, let, me, let me just call this out here to you. Um, you mind if I share what we've been talking about, what's going to happen? Yeah, sure. Uh, we're going to be doing, um, this is, you're the first to know, I'm just going to shout this out here to you. We're going to be doing a um, live rotational show with me, Chris, and Dom. So um, you will see Dom on my channel as well, too. Um, we haven't figured out all the details, but it's going to be starting next month. Um, again, I'm Dom is a real good guy. Dominic. I'm going to say it right today, so just to make sure. I don't know if he's watching or not. I haven't seen his name on there, but um, we've went over this. I've you know reached out to some folks. I've turned down a ton of people to go on their channel or do this or do that. Um, I, I'm very careful on who I associate with. You wouldn't see Chris on this channel if I didn't feel comfortable with Chris. Um, just like Dom. Dom's a real good guy. Dom's, you know, Dom's right up there with us. He's got the same level, the same thoughts, the same thinking, the same everything. So we're going to have a, uh, you know, a show coming out. I'm not going to give you any titles or any dates yet or anything like that, but it's, it's, it's confirmed. We're working on it right now. 
Uh, again, I talked to Chris now outside of here. Um, you know, we've got our chats and texts and emails and all that contact information. We've been going back and forth for a little while too. So um, again, I feel that this would help you bring, bring you some more knowledge, whether it's on my channel or it's on Chris's channel or on Dom's channel, you're going to have, you know, multiple people that are doing the same thing as I do. Dom does videos like I do. Chris definitely does videos like I do. Um, you know, he's the same gist of it. We all have the same similar background. Um, and again, you know, I'm very selective. So, you know, take to heart with, you know, the fact that I'm, I'm bringing these guys in there, that they're that good. So they're, they're worth it. They're legit. They're honest. They're, they're not just selling a handful of items and telling you that they're the best seller in the world or they know every, you know, who you know, there's, there's ones out there I like that. So I laugh. It, it gets, it, it, it aggravates me when I see people talking about, you know, telling you, you, you can just sell 50 of this or a hundred of that. There, there's no, there's no way on earth anybody who's telling you that again, I don't want to keep, you know, beating a dead horse here, but it doesn't work like that. I don't care what anybody tells you like that. There's just no guarantee in life on any of this. You know, I've got a ton of stuff up here. The only thing I can tell you that I sell a bunch of every day of the week is postcards or trade cards, but I'm still not making $10,000 a week by selling six postcards a day. I'm just going to tell you that it, it just doesn't work that way. There's no rhyme or reason or guarantee to you making any specific money. It's all going to be up to you. And I'm not exaggerating that. If you don't spend the time, you're not dedicated. You don't care enough to put in the extra 10 or 20 hours a week, because let's say you only work 40 hours for somebody else. If you're not willing to do 60 hours and that's what it's going to take you to make the money, you might as well quit now. And, and I know people leave me nasty feedback when I say that, but that's a fact. Chris wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. Don wouldn't be here. None of us would be here if it wasn't for the fact that we spent, you know, a ton of our lifetime doing this. I should have done this forever. You know, this is what I should have always done. I found my calling. Chris has found his calling. Dom's found his calling. So I'm picking people who aren't going to be sitting here marketing you their stuff all the time. We're not marketers. We're people who love, and you heard Chris already said that. He loves what he does. I love what I do. I, I honestly and sincerely love what I do. I, I couldn't have picked a better thing to do in my life, no matter what happens. There's just no other way. I just wished I would have found this and done this as a full-time endeavor. Is that is that <laughs> no, pretty I, much I dead wish, on, Chris? I wish I would have kept all my video games and comic books in the early 2000s, man, and all my toys. Like, Yeah, but no, I, I hear you, man. Like, uh, And we really appreciate everyone who's tuned in and, and, and you know, on this journey, we're all on this journey together. And in one of the main reasons why I started my channel was to help others. I don't make a ton of money off my YouTube videos. I literally lose money making my YouTube videos when time. I consider the time. Yeah, exactly. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh so, yeah. I way know too much what you're talking about. Yeah. So, uh, we love you all and we appreciate you guys tuning in and being supportive of all of our channels. Well, you know, as we we're saying here again, it's going to take you guys doing it. And, and again, watch whoever you want. I know some of the videos are enjoyable to watch this kind of video or that kind of video. I watch a lot. There's other channels I watch as well, too. Scott Bearded Picker I like. I like his sense of humor. He seems like a, a jolly person, you know. Um, he's legit. And, you know, his wife's been going through some, some things as well. So that's why Chris, you know, he's working for the Cancer Society. You know, this is it's a small world. We don't have a lot of time in, 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 you know, living in general. So, you know, make the most of it. If you think you want this, this is really what you like to do. You'll find a way, you know, I found a way to do it. I graduated college with nothing. We went through our entire bank account, living on ramen noodles and we made it. It took me a hell of a lot of work. And I don't even say hell very often, as you know, but it took me one hell of a lot of time to get to where I'm at. So the, the folks that, you know, ask, you know, I've got 500 items up. Why am I making a lot of money? It's not enough items or you got the wrong items. You're not researching it. Items and quantity mean nothing. They mean absolutely nothing in my personal opinion, because if it's not a good item, you didn't research it. It's not the right item. It's not going to sell. Uh, there's just no other way around it. And I don't want to be the man in the high box on, you know, on a soapbox here preaching to you all, but <laughs> you know, too many people don't get that. They watch too many videos that, that show you going to a garage. And I do, I do haul videos occasionally, not as much anymore these days because uh, nothing against haul videos at all. Nothing against garage sale videos. Dom does some really good ones too. And I'm not trying to criticize, um, it, you know, anybody specifically, but the whole point is that I can't, my luck at finding something good at a garage sale or at a, a flea market or a thrift store isn't going to equate to you learning anything other than that. Well, Don got really lucky that day. You know, um, uh, 
if I wanted to do garage sale videos, I know my my viewership would go up, and I know my subs, uh, you know, my views would go up, and my subscriber count would go up for sure. I, I I know it because when I do those type of videos, I usually get more. But I'm not. I'm, if I'm going to invest my time into doing this for people, and I'm sure Chris feels similar as well, he's doing educational videos as well too. I mean, I would rather educate you than than you have fun because this is what I do. This is my life. This is what I want out of my life is to do this full time and advance it into the biggest damn eBay business you've ever seen. Um, again, and, and money wise, whether you know I'm making a fortune or not, I would still. I've done eBay since eBay was eBay. Whether we made a fortune, whether we did it as full time or not, I like the flipping aspect. Uh, again, um, you, what do you think about flipping, Chris? Is that like something made for you? Yeah, I like the treasure hunt. That's my, my. I think that's what really got me into this whole thing is being young and going to you know garage sales and stuff and just looking for treasure. Like everyone, we all have found treasure in some point, but I know like there's something out there that's like the million dollar item or the you know the fifty thousand dollar items out there. And and I, I feel like you know a treasure hunter, like literally. And I think that's what I enjoy the most about uh, my experience and my education and what I my skill set. You know, I, I'm going to find something eventually one of these days. I found those $5,000 statues. That was a gut thing that I bought. It wasn't something that I knew was worth money, but I used my experience and I followed my gut. And, you know, it, it, that time it worked out. But those treasures are out there. Yeah, they definitely are out there. Uh, again, if you don't know or don't have the experience, it's hard. Like Chris popping on something that's worth five grand. Would you have known that it's worth that much? Probably not. A lot of people probably wouldn't. Whatever the item is, it doesn't matter whether it's a postcard or a comic book or something or a first appearance you were on with um, uh, uh, Dom the other day. And like uh, we were talking about things like that, like a Nolan Ryan rookie card or something along that line. If you don't know, you haven't spent a lot of time, you're going to miss stuff like that. That's why I've said there's this huge learning curve. And, and just like going back to the people that tell you you buy 50 pairs of jeans or you sell 50 pairs of shoes. You know, everybody's skill set's different. So, yeah, maybe there is somebody who can go out and buy 50 pairs of jeans in a huge city that's got a ton of thrift stores and only buys the high dollar ones. The majority of the population is not going to have that luck. I, I can promise you 90, 95 percent of everybody watching this is not going to make it as a full time reseller. You know, either they're not going to be dedicated enough. There won't be the sourcing opportunities or something along that line. They just don't want to put in the hours. I would rather put in 70 hours doing reselling like this than put in 30 hours working for somebody else. Uh, I've I've burned through uh, the experiences of, of uh, you know, of my life that were just horrid and, and just awful working for people. Um, you know, I, I'm just not not interested in that at all. I don't care what it'll take. If you want the freedom like like, you know, resellers would have in general or the ability to do something that you like. You know, eBay is is it for me that not just eBay, but reselling in general. I don't want to just niche it to, to eBay um, again because we sell on other platforms, too. So um, I, on your on the cancer store, Chris, do they just sell on eBay or have they branched out to other platforms? Uh, we have experimented with other platforms and we are experimenting with other platforms right now. It's kind of a little bit of a pro secret project, I want to say. But uh, we are officially on eBay and anyone can go to cancer.org slash eBay to go directly to our eBay store. Is is that um, something that you they can offer as a a uh, donation as well? Like um, it, you've got the uh, so much of your purchase goes to here. Is that an option? Oh, with oh yeah. So eBay Giving Works. I I think they rebranded it. To, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I think they call it eBay Charity now, but the old name was eBay Giving Works. So if you do want to do that, you can also um, you know do ten percent, fifty percent, one hundred percent. If you want to choose a, a charity, the American Cancer Society, or if you're locally here in Burbank or in the Los Angeles area, you can come donate stuff and get a nice tax write off for uh, this year. Yeah, that's another thing. As Chris saying here, a lot of people don't understand the taxes of this whole aspect of it. You know, like Chris is working for somebody. I'm working for somebody too myself. My clothing, and I've said this before, your clothing, all these other things, your mileage, um, things that you donate are all tax deductible. They all can lower your actual tax bill at the end of the year by doing this. I itemize everything. You got to itemize to do this. You, you got to have an accountant. Well, you don't have to, but we have an accountant that does this. So I save receipts. Everything I donate, everything that gets trashed off, everything I do, my clothing, you'll see me wearing the same stuff. Again, because it's a tax write-off. If I ruin a shirt packing up something, it's a business shirt. If I'm outsourcing and I ruin my boots, they're business boots or my 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 steel toe. When I go to a pick and I'm like at a barn or something, I wear steel toe boots. I wear, 
you know, thick pants. I, I've even thought about wearing tin pants when I go, if you know what tinned pants are. I don't. Um, I'm sure they're do. like lined with some kind of metal sheeting or something. Well, no, it's like, um, it's like a coating on them and they're, they're semi burn re resistant, but you uh, won't, if, if like you, uh, push up on like broken glass. It's not going to go into the the fabric. It's it's just going to pretty much hang there. Um, and and I have a friend who has them. And he wears them, but he he does um, automobile picks and stuff like that too. And and he's he buys old cars and resells the parts on eBay. He wears that those pants, and I've seen him. So that's something I was thinking about. I know it's kind of off topic, but <laughs> anyway, uh, we're running almost to the two hour mark. So let's give uh, Chris uh, last thoughts here on um, the future on you know what chris is thinking about with the future for everybody um some positive remarks some things along that line here for everybody to get out there after this uh live chat here and to start doing some more work yeah i, I just you know everyone's destiny is up to them it's however much time and energy you want to put into your business is how you're going to be successful you're going to come across a lot of failures and a lot of setbacks but don't let that hold you back uh just stay the course know that this business is not an easy one it's going to take a lot of time to be successful and this is a marathon it's not a, a race to the finish a, a sprint it is literally a marathon and learn as much as you can and by watching channels like dawn and uh, other channels you know you can become educated rather quickly from the wealth of experience that we have so uh yeah just i want to leave everyone with that good point as chris said this is not a marathon i am not in a race with anybody I don't care how many boxes you send out. I don't care how much you sold a day. Um, I holler out sometimes those figures only because I get bugged on that constantly. Um, I don't give out much on financials again because it means nothing. My business is not your business. Don't worry about what somebody else is doing. Don't worry that Joe Schmo sent out five, 500 packages in one day. Who knows? They were a dollar item. You know, I've sent out one package worth 10 grand before. I, it doesn't matter. The quantity... The, the, the items are selling or what another person is doing means nothing. Start it as your own business. Don't worry about others. You know, it's you. It's your business if you want this. If you can't put the dedication and the time in, you know, you don't want it bad enough. I want this. This is what I want. This is all I want. This is, you know, paying every bill that I've ever had in, in here. We've It's caught us up. I'm financially sound. My wife doesn't want or worry and neither do my kids. And that is what this has brought me. Something I could never do working in, in foods or any of the other uh, jobs, even as a general manager and as a regional manager for three years, I still make more as a reseller than as a general manager. And I got bonuses of $25,000 or more on several occasions quarterly. An average bonus for a good GM or a regional manager is five grand at least every three months, every 90 days, every quarter. And, and I make more than that. And I'm not trying to do it as a brag, but I put in all that time, 70, uh, even 80 hours sometimes working as a, as a district manager, and I don't have much to show for it. So, you know, it is what you make of it. Chris has found his calling. I found my calling. Are you going to be following or finding your calling as well too? So I will leave it at that. I will say goodbye. Let Chris say goodbye. And we're going to sign off. See you guys. Thanks for tuning in.